This white powder is the bit of houseplant kit you never knew you needed. What is it? Diatomaceous earth. Dieta what now? Diatomaceous earth, my plant friend, and it can make your houseplants very happy. But what in the blue blazers is it? Well, I won't bore you with all the science, but basically, in the prehistoric world, there were single-celled creatures called diatoms. These diatoms were decked out in a glassy armour called silica. Still with me? We're nearly there, I promise. Now, fast forward a few million years, and these diatoms have turned into ancient fossils. We scoop up these fossilised diatoms, grind them into a fine powdery substance, and voila! You've got yourself diatomaceous earth. So what's this got to do with anything? Well, diatomaceous earth is like Mother Nature's secret weapon in the war against creepy crawlies, as well as a few other things I'll come to later in this video. Under the microscope, diatomaceous earth looks like tiny shards of glass, and this is key. You see, it can be used as a mechanical insecticide. But what in the bejesus is a mechanical insecticide, I hear you cry? Basically, it's a non-toxic pest control. This means it doesn't work like a poison to kill annoying critters, but instead dehydrates them by getting up all in their grill when they inadvertently walk all over it. Here's how it works, and I'll use spider mites as an example. So, Mr. Spider Mite comes along and decides to turn your snake plant into its new home. It sees that it doesn't rain much in the area because snake plants don't like to be watered too much, and this is perfect for nest making. Plus, there's tons of fleshy meat to feast on every day. So he goes about his business procreating and making a little colony of thousands of offspring on your plant. Upon close inspection, you notice this happening because the little gits have been too greedy and sucked a load of the sap from the leaves and a network of tiny webs has shown itself under your light. Now, because you've watched this video, you grab yourself some diatomaceous earth and apply it in and around the whole plant. And by the way, don't worry, I'll give you some pointers on how best to apply it in a jiffy. So the leaves are coated in the dust of this stuff, and because Mr. Spider Mite isn't the brightest spark in the electrical box, he carries on with his business oblivious to its dangers and walks all over it. But what's this? It's getting all over his body and he can't get it off. It's too fine and powdery. It's destroying his exoskeleton because it's so abrasive and he's got no A&E to help him. He's been sliced and diced into oblivion. He's been Chuck Norris'd. And now he's dying a slow, horrible death through dehydration. There's no escape. Eventually, all his brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles and sons and daughters follow the same fate because they're just as inquisitive as him and want to know what all the fuss is about until eventually the whole colony dies off and your snake plant is saved. Beautiful, isn't it? And this doesn't just work for spider mites either. Nope, anything that tries to make hay on your plants will get the same treatment. Frips, fungus gnats, aphids, ants, you name it. All it takes is for them to walk over the powder and it's good night Vienna. The beauty of this stuff is that it sticks around like a fart in an elevator. As long as you don't wash it off the leaves, it will stay there protecting your green baby. You see, the spider mite cycle is a hard one to break. It's why they're so persistent and annoying. You might be able to kill the adults with a spray down and wipe, but the little gits will have laid tons of eggs ready to hatch and repeat the cycle all over again. It's a vicious cycle of epic proportions. You need something to break that cycle, and diatomaceous earth is just that thing. I know what you're thinking, of course, but Mr. Sheffield, a systemic insecticide does just as good a job and kills off the little beasts when they have a nibble of the flesh. Why bother going through all the pain of dusting the leaves with this annoying fine powder? Well, my planty friend, the key difference between the two is that one is a poison and one is a mechanical insecticide. There is no danger of the pest building up an immunity to a mechanical insecticide. There's no escape, unless they somehow develop daddy long legs to tread over the powder and avoid getting it all over their bodies. Of course, a systemic might be working just fine for you, and if that's the case, then have at it. But if you want an option that is safe for people and pets, because, you know, it's not a poison, this stuff is a good bet. This means if your dog or cat, or even three-year-old little boy has a tendency to nibble at a leaf here or there, 
it's not going to be a massive drama. Seriously, if anyone knows why three-year-olds love to eat plants, then let me know. It's lost on me. So I was using it a little while ago to help combat my fungus gnat problem before I got too impatient and decided to go nuclear with the ultimate solution, beneficial nematodes, but it should work as a good deterrent for these mighty beasts. I've had lots of folks in the comments say it's worked wonders for them, but I was at the point where I was pulling my already limited hair out that I needed a quicker solution. The problem with nematodes is that once they've eaten the larvae, they run out of food and they die off. Bring a plant in from the store that has a gnat or two and you've got problems. Well, a layer of this stuff over the soil should help prevent them making hay. If they do try to get in, they'll get it all over their skins and die a horrible death. No less than they deserve if you ask me. So what about some other benefits? Most of you will know that I've recently switched from using compost in my houseplants to using soil mixes from Cybotanica because I realised, with the help of my lovely viewers of course, that fungus gnats love to make hay in compost. Since switching to Cybotanica, I've noticed they're far less willing to make a home in my plants, which is great. Now, obviously, I've still got a lot of plants living in my old compost mix, and the one big difference I've noticed between those plants compared to the ones living in cyber soil is the smell. Compost can absolutely reek. Have you noticed this? It makes perfect sense, really. It's broken down bits of decaying plant and garden matter after all, and if left undisturbed, can start to grow mold and fungus. Not pretty. Well, if your soil mix has a tendency to do this, then this is where diatomaceous earth comes in. It's a natural deodorizer. Yep, it's the links or axe for plants. Because it can absorb excess moisture many times greater than its weight, it acts like a sponge and helps keep fungus and mold in the soil at bay. You can even mix some into the soil of a stinky plant or add it to your soil mix before you pop one up. You might be thinking, but Mr. Sheffield, this stuff sounds really abrasive. It kills bugs on contact after all. Doesn't it do the same to roots? Be rest assured, my plant friend. It's perfectly safe for the roots. It's much too fine to do any damage whatsoever. In fact, adding diatomaceous earth to soil mixes as a matter of course can actually be a pro move. Like I said, it is highly porous and helps improve the drainage of soil which prevents it from becoming waterlogged. This is crucial because, as you know, our fussy green friends hate sitting in waterlogged soil. If you saw my video on the real causes of root rot, then you'll know that it's the lack of oxygen around the roots that does the real damage, and not necessarily just the water. Well, diatomaceous earth creates tiny air pockets in the soil, allowing oxygen to reach plant roots more easily. A double win for soil health then. Now, before you run out and buy some, here's something key to know. There are two types you can buy, food grade and filter grade, and food grade is the one you want. Without getting too technical, food grade is used commercially in things like makeup, water filters, and even food and beverages as anti-caking agents and clarifiers, whereas filter grade is inedible and used for industrial things like uh, dynamite production. So unless you want to blow up your plants, stick to food grade. And it's all readily available too. I don't think it's banned anywhere, like BTI is banned in the UK, so you should be able to easily get your hands on it. I've even got it listed in my Amazon store down below. Not a shameless plug, I promise. Just trying to be helpful. Right, I'll be honest and say that this stuff can be tricky to apply, especially to the leaves of the plant, but I do have a couple of tricks I'll be kind enough to share with you. So if you're fighting fungus snatch, you need something that is going to apply a nice even layer across the surface of the soil, which is easier said than done because it's so fine, it's a bit clumpy and doesn't want to spread on helpfully like something like caster sugar. Trying to dust it evenly on with a spoon could be a bit of a nightmare, let me tell you. I tried using a little fine sieve used for baking but I didn't get very far with that. I then hit upon the idea of using an old spice jar and this does seem to do a job. It's not perfect because it clumps together in the jar and doesn't want to come out easily, but with enough shakes, it does come out. You can try a salt shaker, of course, but I do get the feeling that the holes will be too small. And if you've got a better solution, then please do help a brother out. I saw a video of someone using a turkey baster, but it didn't seem too effective. Now, if you're fighting leaf-eating bugs like mites and frips, you need to somehow dust the leaves so the bug crawls along and coats itself. 
The problem is, of course, that these little bugs are crafty and tend to hang out on the underside of leaves and in all the nooks and crannies. I mean, getting dust in there defies gravity, right? Well, there are two ways of doing it as far as I can see. The first one is grabbing a paintbrush or large makeup brush, taking your plant and diatomaceous earth outside liberally dusting the leaves trying your best to get on the underside of the leaves. It will create a big dusty mess so it's best to wear a mask and probably some gloves if your hands are easily irritated. And don't be shy about spreading it on. If you've got an infestation you want to try and get a thin coating on all the areas of the leaves. Leave it on for a couple of weeks and give the plant a thorough check over. If it looks like the little buggers are finished then wash the plant down. If you still have your suspicions then give it another coating and wait another couple of weeks. It's better to be safe than sorry. It doesn't need to be left on the plant all the time as a preventative. And in any case, this risks harming the cells of the leaves if you leave it on all the time. A hack that I came across when researching this video is to mix some diatomaceous earth with water into a kind of paste, add it to a spray bottle and spray down the leaves. You leave it to dry and a powder coating should form on the leaves. Pretty neat, eh? Now, the key with diatomaceous earth is making sure it stays dry. It only works to coat and dehydrate the pest if it's dry. When it gets damp and goes clumpy, it's far less effective. This is when it becomes tricky for use against fungus gnats, particularly if you top water, so consider bottom watering if you're going to get some. Even if you do bottom water, the top of the soil can still get quite moist, which is probably when the little gits will see the opportunity and invade. And diatomaceous earth is also not selective on what bugs it ends up killing. Anything small enough and with an exoskeleton is in danger of getting coated in this stuff. What does this mean? That it can't be used in conjunction with predatory mites. It will kill them just as much as the pest you're going after, so choose one or the other. And if you want to know all about using beneficial nematodes to wipe out a gnat population, then check out the video on the screen now. And subscribe.